sometimes customers, we always like to introduce a uh, visiting speaker. Of course, this one, most of you know, Tommy Duff, he is the minister of the Collinsville Church of Christ. And uh, he is trying out for the work here. So at the end of the services this morning, I think we, uh, we have some uh, sheets to hand out. And we're going to do that with every speaker that comes and, and speaks to us. We like your input from that. Uh, so uh, from his speaking. I want you to be aware of that. We're going to give him a survey, too, to fill out on us. <laughs> but anyway, this morning, Tommy's going to be preaching to us. And good wife Susan is with us. They do have a son. He is a so-called rep at VMI. And so pray for him as he is uh, there. And uh, pray that he will get through this first year of uh, being a rep there, being a VMI. Appreciate his point of service country. Whether that might have been his first choice or not, I'm not sure. But anyway, he's able to be able to speak with us more now. Tommy uh, is a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. Uh, he is a member, or was a member of the West Side Church of Christ. And uh, if you all remember, we did uh, help in some small way to help him go through his uh, preaching school there. And uh, he owes me a sermon. I told many of you that uh, one of the agreements was that if we helped any student go through school, he was supposed to come back and preach to us. And I think maybe you did, but I wasn't here. But anyway, he owes me a sermon today, and I'm going to do it today. Uh, we're having trouble with our microphones and everything this morning, so uh, if you have trouble hearing and you, maybe you can't, move up closer to your front uh, if, you, if you need to. Uh, so Tommy will know to speak just a little bit louder. We're going to try to get it going, but if sometime during church services you hear a big loud squeaking sound that means we probably got it working. But anyway, uh, Tommy, come preach. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'll try to speak up loudly. Give everybody an opportunity to hear. It is a great opportunity to come and, and be with people of like precious faith and to open up God's Word. And many faces, uh, have familiarity with, and some are, I do not, but that's okay. Uh, I always like to say that the more people I meet, the more Christians I meet, I should say, that's more people I know in heaven. So I'm indeed grateful for the opportunity that the elders have given me, and uh, if you need help filling out that form, I think I can do that for you. <laughs> but I want you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 12, and we're going to just touch briefly on a passage, and this passage is already out there on the marquee. I was a little surprised when I saw my name out there. I was a little concerned I hit the wrong person. I pulled in, I was like, oh, they're expecting somebody today. But I want to talk about following Jesus this morning. Who will follow Jesus? You know, that's a question that's been asked many times. If you recall when... Uh, Simon and, and Andrew were out on the boat. Jesus told them to come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. If you recall, he also made a statement saying that, that is Jesus, making the statement that pick up your cross, bear your burdens, and follow me, he said. Another occasion after Jesus' resurrection, uh, Peter is over there beside him, and he tells Peter that he needs to feed his sheep. He also says, follow me. And if you look with me at John chapter 12 and verse 26, it says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You know, who will follow Jesus has been a question for over 2,000 years. There have been some that have, and then there have been others that have not. For our case today, there may be someone here this morning asking themselves, will I follow Jesus? But for the rest of us that have already obeyed the gospel command, we are saying to ourselves, will we continue to follow Jesus? It is our choice. God has given us everything that we need in order for us to obey Him. But still, He gives it to us to make that decision whether we are going to follow Him or not. This morning, we want to look at three things, but we're going to break them down into four questions on each topic. The things that we want to see, who will follow Jesus? Who will follow Jesus? Well, will it be those that are Convicted, converted, connected. Those are the three things that we want to see this morning. Hopefully we can do that as we open up the scriptures, as we look through God's word, as we 
see the direction in which Jesus wants us to follow. And by doing so, we can know more about Him, and we can know about more about us as we try to follow Him in the best of our ability. Let's just look at a few things this morning. Only those who are convicted will follow Jesus. You know, the best thing for us to do, and I think sometimes we, we, we need to ask ourselves questions. Uh, when, when we're asking, am I convicted? Uh, what is convicted mean? Uh, what does conviction say? What does conviction look like? And how do I become convicted? Or how can I be convicted? Those four questions are going to be very similar as we go through our sermon this morning. So let's ask those questions. What does conviction mean? You know, the best thing to do is to open up a dictionary, to look and to see what these words mean. Sometimes we get a good definition, uh, but sometimes it's not a good biblical definition. Uh, if I was to tell you and you were to ask me, what should I use when studying the Bible? Well, you need a dictionary and you need a Bible dictionary. And those things are different. And it's good for us to, to look at specific words and try to understand them and try to, to, to you know, grow in our knowledge. So let's just continue. What does conviction mean? It means to be proved or determined to be guilty. It's a legal term. If you had a prosecuting attorney, he is wanting to prove or to convict uh, the defendant. He wants to be able to show enough information that would convict this person. Let's think of that on our sense as being uh, sinners. You know, we're proved or determined to be guilty. And there must be sufficient evidence. Evidence uh, to convince someone of the error uh, to, uh, or the accused. Uh, error of, or the truth of the accused. Think about that. You've got to prove it. Well, Christ proved it, didn't he? Christ proved that there was sin in the world. And it took Christ coming and being our sacrifice, our propitiation, to be that. To give us hope, an expectation of heaven, to be reconciled with God the Father. Having that it only come from Christ because He is the only perfect one. The only one that could shed the blood. And we know that it could not be bulls of goats, bulls or goats that we find in Hebrews chapter 9. tells us that it takes the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, uh, the example in which we have. But there must be sufficient evidence to convince someone. So but what does conviction say? I am guilty as charged, a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that Jesus is the only way that I can have redemption, that I can be reconciled. It takes that from us. We have to recognize, yes, I am a sinner. I have been separated from God, and I need the blood of Christ to bring me back, to allow me to have that relationship, that fellowship with God. John chapter 14 and verse 6 says, I am the way. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. And it says, I am the way. Jesus says that. What it really means is I am the only way. I am the only way. You cannot find salvation in any other name. And that's exactly what Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 teaches. Neither is there any other name given under heaven. Among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. It is through Christ that we have salvation. And we must never lose sight of our sin. I know we're probably thinking, well, you know, the Apostle Paul told us to, to forget those things which are behind us. And to press toward the mark of high calling of Christ Jesus. Yes, we need to do that, Absolutely. We shouldn't dwell on the fact that we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Uh, we shouldn't dwell on the fact that we had sins and that the blood of Christ cleansed us from those sins. And 
we should let those sins go away, but never lose sight that we still sin. 1 John 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. We are sinners. Now, once we obey the gospel and, and we're cleansed of the blood and we're made new, we're that new creature, we don't live for sin. Yes, we'll occasionally sin. Yes, we'll make a misstep. We'll, we'll fumble the ball sometimes to make a football analogy. But we are not living our life to sin. But only those convicted that we know we need help. You know, we walk down this, this path of life. And as we walk, we're going to get pulled and tugged in a lot of different directions. What we cannot allow to happen is that we cannot lose sight on Jesus as well. Keep our eyes on Jesus. What does conviction mean? What does conviction say? But what does conviction look like? Conviction looks like the evidence and looks at the evidence and puts our faith into action so others may see it through us. How are they going to see us being convicted? Think about conviction for a minute. And you think about that first gospel sermon that was preached on Pentecost. And Peter is standing there and he's telling all those that are in attendance that they were the ones that crucified Jesus. They were the ones that put Christ on the cross. And it says that they were pricked in the heart. They were convicted by their sin to make a change, to do something about it. Looks at the evidence and puts our faith into action. Others will know we are Christians by our love. Now Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We need to have love and compassion. It tells us in Ephesians 4 and verse 15 that we are to teach the truth in love. That's how we go about it. People need to see that in us. They also need to see that light shining in us as well. You know, Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus tells us that we need to be that light. And we need to let that light shine. I had the benefit, and this is something I like to bring up sometimes whenever I'm back in the Roanoke Valley. I had the benefit of living in the Roanoke Valley, growing up here, and seeing the star city of the South a lot. I remember back in 2001 when it started being red, white, and blue. I remember back when there used to be a, a death by a drunk driver that the star was red. And, and there may be some here that, that don't know that. We know that it shines uh, in a white color nowadays. But that star sits 89 feet tall. It's like that city that sits on a hill that cannot be hit. You see it. And it shines brightly. That's the kind of light that we need to be shining to those around us so we know we're convicted. We know that we needed the blood of Christ. And we need to be able to show that to other people through our love, through our example, through our light shining brightly around everyone. Another analogy I like to give about light is that light comes in many different ways, doesn't it? I know the time has gotten a little bit different and we don't see those little things that blink at night. I call them lightning bugs. I don't know what you call them. Maybe call them fireflies. But I call them lightning bugs. And I, when I was a kid, one of the things that I liked to do mostly was to run out there and, and grab them and put them in a jar. That wasn't very nice, was it? They died. Um, but they only blink sometimes, right? They're off and they're on. You know, Dad, ask ourselves about our life. Is it on sometimes? Is it off sometimes? Do we turn it on? Do we turn it off? That's a good representation. We can see that. We can put it in our minds. We can see that firefly, that lightning bug turning on and turning off. What about a refrigerator? We know that light's on, right? I mean, pull open the door.
door, it's on, but we close it, and there's that thought, well, does it turn off? Does it always stay on? Well, that light is only on when people are watching. You ever notice that? Is that the way our light is? That the only time that we open up that door, that light shines. And it shines brightly, but our light, and I know, and I've met a lot of nice people this morning, very friendly, and, and you've probably seen that I tried to reciprocate the best I could, being friendly. But when I walk out of this door, I want my light to be shining just as it was today. But there are some that, that when they walk out those doors, they turn their light off. It's not the same. But what about like a dimmer switch? Turn it high, you can turn it low, you can adjust it whenever. Maybe whenever you feel like it. Or what about another one? I just this is the last one, the last little analogy that we'll make. What about that when the lights go out and it's very dark and you go into the, the bottom of the, the cabinet and you start looking for that flashlight and uh, by the time that you find it, the lights it's not coming on. You checking the batteries. Sometimes that's what happens to us. Our light goes out and it's hard to get turned back on. People need to see us as a good example. The good example that's here this morning needs to be shown out there through our love and our appreciation for Christ and what he did for us. But how can I be convicted? This is the best place. The more you open it, the more you study it, the more of God lives in you. The more the Lord lives in you. You've got it. Study to show yourselves approved. A workman needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 15. You have it. You have that word. You know, that's the great thing about the word today. You have it in your Bible. You have it on your iPad. You have it on your, your mobile phone. You have it everywhere with you these days. First thing when I got my new phone, the first thing I went is I got my Bible out and put on. Just so I can keep my Bible with me everywhere I go. How can I be converted? We need to know that sin is deadly. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is dead. And we know by what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59.1 and 2 that sin separates us from God. To the point where he turns his head and he will not hear. And that sins will be punished. Acts 3, Acts 3 and verse 19 tells us that unless we repent and be, convert, be converted and have our sins blotted out, we will miss out on being with the Lord. That's how I can be convicted. So only those that are convicted will follow Jesus. But the second thing that we want to look at this morning is only those who are converted will follow Jesus. Only those that are converted. So let's look at those same four questions. You know, what does conversion mean? What does conversion say? What does conversion look like? And how can I be converted? Looking at this, this sermon this morning, this lesson that we're, that we're noticing, not only will it help us in our daily struggle in our life and our trying to serve and strive to be more like Christ each day, it will help us in addressing those that we want to know or we want them to know uh, the gospel of Christ. So what does conversion mean? Or it means to change formation. When we talk about uh, being converted, we talk about repentance. Repentance is a change of direction. Um, we need to turn towards the way of righteousness and turn away from, from going down a different, different way, a different path. We need to be on that narrow path. We don't need to deviate. We don't need to go to the right. We don't need to go to the left. We just need to continue to go down that way. No, 
Jesus is the way of righteousness. He is the one that has paved the road for us. We are to follow him. It's easy, isn't it? It's easy for me to say it. It's easy for us to, to think about it this morning, changing formation, turning towards the way of righteousness, walking down that narrow path. That narrow path, we could open up Matthew chapter 7, look at verses 13 and 14, and we can see that, that you know, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow, that, that straight gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And it's not an easy road, that narrow road. It's a, it's a bumpy road with many obstacles and difficulties. But it's up to us what we do. You know, we get knocked down or we're going to get back up. Or are we going to try to find that quickest detour? We need to look towards righteousness. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2 tells us that we need to, to lay aside the, the sin and the weight that, that besets us. And it tells us to look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. By defining that, that phrase in its original language, it literally means an intense focus. That's what Jesus wants from each of his servants, each of his family. And, and we're not to turn from the, the left or the right. If you read about David, as David's ending his reign and his life's coming to an end, he, he gives Solomon, his son, some instruction. And he tells his son to stay in the statutes and the commandments and the precepts of the Lord. And he tells him, do not go to your left and do not go to your right. Stay in the Lord. Well, he didn't figure it out until it was much later in life where we read at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes where we're told that Solomon says, Fear God and keep His commandments. Sometimes it takes a little while to, to let it all soak in and, and come together. And I know we're, we're, we're like clay. We're, we're being molded each day. And we're growing each day. And we should be growing each day. And I should be stronger today than I was last week month ago. And I should hope that six weeks, six months, I should be even stronger than I am now. Those are goals that we should be looking and, and trying to attain. But what does conversion say? I am a Christian, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, called into the kingdom of light so that I may no longer walk Jesus pulled off the boat, figuratively speaking. He says, come and be a fisher of me. Follow me. Well, we know Peter had some ups and downs. Then we read about Peter preaching that first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had told him to follow me. Here, Peter is telling those of like precious faith, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, he says. He says, you have been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. We are different. We are to be different. You know, it, it, 
it's, it's funny, especially when you, you come in contact with someone that's a member of the church, that you, you may be visiting uh, another place, and you're, you're not in worship service, but you're out, and somebody notices you, and they'll go, well, you're, you're a member of the church, aren't you? Well, how do you know that? I'm not wearing it anywhere. I don't have a name badge. Just by the way that you're acting, by the example in which you're leading. I am different, and I'm going to be different. And I'm not going back to the way that I was. So, what does it look like? A person who receives the word with an open heart keeps the word that he's been taught, and then he produces fruit. Luke chapter 8 talks about the parable of the soil. Talks about four different kinds of soil. Talks about the, the wayside soil where you're throwing the seed and, and nothing happens. Foul the air comes and takes it away. And what are we sowing? That seed. The seed, it's the, it's the word of God. And we're sowing it. And we're sowing it to that, that thorny soul. And that, that the thorny soul, and we see that it, that it comes up, but the, the desires of the world chokes it out. Or, or what about the rocky soil where it comes up really fast, but it doesn't take root, and then it goes away. But then finally he talks about that fertile soil. That good soil. That soil where it grows and produces fruit. And people should be able to see us by our fruit. So how can I be converted? How can that happen? <coughs> Jesus tells us, doesn't he, in Matthew chapter 8, 18, when he brings forth this young child into the midst, and he says, if we are converted, we will be as little children. Be humble, be loving, forgiving. Those are the, the attributes of a little child. A little child is innocent, it learns other things. But a child is innocent, and we need to be that kind of person. That's how I can be converted. And we need to accept Jesus for who He is. And turn to Him on His terms, not what we would like Jesus to be. But the way that it's written for us in Scripture. He will help us in every facet of life. We know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that uh, we can cast our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. We know that He loves us so much that He died for us. We know that He's going to be there for us. Let's just put our faith and trust in Him. And turn ourselves over to Him. And allow Him to direct our steps. You know, I hear people say it all the time. Jesus is my co-pilot. Jesus needs to be the pilot. And we need to follow him. How can I be converted? Well, let's look at the last thing this morning. Only those who are connected will follow Jesus. Now, I'm, you know, social media is a big thing these days. And staying connected. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those are there. Maybe there's a few others that I haven't mentioned. There's uh, texting and emailing, those kinds of things are, are a little passe. I still like to text quite a bit. But we want to stay connected, don't we? Connected to those people that we like, people we love. We want to always kind of know when everything's going on. We want to be connected. Well, we need to stay connected to Jesus. And we can. Only those that are connected will follow Jesus. So here, we've got to answer those four questions again. What does connection mean? What does connection say and what does connection look like and how can I be connected? So what does connection mean? Well, it means to join, to connect, to have a close relation. You know, theoretically, we are to be the same in the church. We're members. We're, as Ephesians 4, we are fitly joined together. We are to speak the truth in love, it says being fitly joined together. We are to be all working together. That's how we 
we stay connected, working together, always trying to make the church number one, always rolling up our sleeves and getting to work and doing the things that are necessary. Uh, not all of us can be teachers, but we can all be servants. We can all work in the kingdom and do great things for the Lord. So what does con connection say? I'm here, use me. I may not be able to do much, but I can do something. Put me to work. That's what it means that we are to do. You know, I'm not, as Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, I'm not to think more highly of myself. I'm, you know, sometimes they put preachers on pedestals. Well, we shouldn't be on pedestals. When you see a preacher standing here, you shouldn't see him. You should see the cross of Christ. We should be transparent. Only hearing the message that's being spoken. But we can all do something. And we should know that each of us are very important. We're all part of the family of God. All those that have obeyed the gospel, we are part of the family. We all have worth. We can all come together. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's just look at that very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look with me at just a few verses there. Just a few verses, uh, beginning in verse 14. It says, For the body is not one member, but many. And verse 19 says, If they were all one member, where, which, where, where were the body? But now are the many members, yet but one body. And verse 24 says, For our comely, our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice. We're not to have any schism, division, uh, separation. We also be speaking and doing the same thing. Same mind, same body. Having affection for one another. Loving one another. Caring for one another. You know, the greatest thing that the church brings is each other together. That when I'm having a bad day, or when I've got something troublesome. I've got brothers and sisters I can call on. That I can lean on. That can help me through. What does connection look like? It's like playing connected dots. You ever do that? Where you, you start at number one, you go to two, and by the time you get done, you, you come out with a picture. And what I mean by that is that the early church was connected. And their example speaks to us today. Remember, they sold everything that they had. They all came together. They all went from house to house. They all loved and appreciated and wanted to be together. And, and I, man, you know, having a fellowship meal today and, and hearing that you guys are having a progressive dinner and the things that you guys are, are, are trying to do and staying connected is awesome. That's what helps grow the church. That's what helps show the appreciation and love for one another. But how can I be connected? Realize just how important you are in the body. Within that, we talked about we had to have affection for one for another. But Romans 12 and verse 15 specifically says that we are to rejoice with one another and we are to weep with one another. We need that. Like I said, I, I need to be able to, to lean on my brothers and sisters. Good times and bad. And do not be afraid to do something. Be active, confident, and know that you are involved with the Lord's work. Bible class this morning, we briefly talked about uh, the parable of the talents. And he talked about the two men who went out and, and did as his master commanded them. Five became ten, ten uh, two became four. But this one, this last one, he had his talents, but he went out and buried it. Why? Because he was afraid. Let's
let's not be afraid of getting out there and doing something. Staying connected. It could be little, it could be great. But we all have work to do in the kingdom of God. So who will follow Jesus? Those that are convicted. Those who are converted. And those who stay connected. If you are not a member of the Lord's body today, you truly can become one. Allow that message that we've heard this morning to convict your hearts. To make it ask that question, what shall we do? Well, what shall we do? Well, that gospel plan of salvation says you have to hear the word of God, Romans 10 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That we have to believe the message and believe that Christ is who he says he is. John 8, 24, he says, If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sin. We need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We need to be willing to repent, having that conversion, that change, from a, a world of, of sinfulness, worldliness, to following Jesus. We must be willing to confess his name, not only now, but forevermore that He is our Lord and our Savior. Because if we confess His name, He will confess our name before His Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32-33. And we must be buried with Him in baptism. Where we make contact with that blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all our sin, makes us whole, makes us part of the redeemed, added to the body of Christ. If we can help you in any way this morning, if you've never obeyed, you can if you need the prayers of the church, or maybe there is something amiss in your life that needs to be corrected, let's do it now as we stand and as we sing.